Hi, welcome to Cloud Cover. My name is Ryan Dunn. And my name is David Aiken. This week, Dave is going to be filling in for Steve Marks, who is actually the new Iron Chef Japan. Or, no, he's presenting in Japan, I believe. I hope so. We have a great show this week. We're going to be t talking about some of the new news that we have in terms of on the platform. We're going to be talking about some billing. In fact, David's going to be covering that. Uh, we'll talk about the role entry point, which a lot of folks have questions on during the life cycle of their application. And we'll round it out with a tip on how to troubleshoot when things go wrong in that role entry point. So with that, David, you have something to tell us about billing? I do. I have something to tell you about billing. So First of all, when you go to sign up for a brand new Windows Azure, SQL Azure, App Fabric account, you go to the Windows Azure portal, you click on billing, you go through to sign up for our Microsoft Online uh, plat billing platform, and you need to create a brand new account. So this first account that you create is what we call the billing account. And this is the account that you're going to set up the billing relationship with Microsoft. So you're going to need um, a credit card or some of the means of, of paying for usage here. So this is billing. You're going to need a live ID. And you're going to want to get your project manager or your finance director to go and create this, this, this billing account for you. Now once you have that billing account in place, the next thing to go and do is to create a subscription. Now a subscription is where your, your developer can have the account can deploy to the cloud, can manage their applications. So two accounts, a billing and a subscription. So what's in a subscription? Well, a subscription will allow you to create five storage projects, up to 20 small compute instances. If you need to go beyond there, then the billing person needs to get in touch with Microsoft and arrange for that quota to be increased. That's just a simple phone call, right? Absolutely. It's, it's just an email, a simple phone call to, to get through to Microsoft and have that um, adjusted there. Um, we obviously make sure that you can afford to pay for the extra instances, so we do um, credit checks and things. Um, however, it's the billing person that does that. This subscription also has a live ID, and this can be different. This can be a different live ID. So your finance director has this one. Your project lead maybe has created a live ID specifically for that project. And this subscription, you can decide how to pay for it. We have consumption-based models, and we have some prepaid options as well. And all of that information is on the, the portal there. You can also create multiple subscriptions. So I've got subscription one. I can create subscription two. It's a separate live ID. So each project that I have, I can create a separate subscription, have separate teams working on them, and the billing account gets the consolidated bill from each of the subscriptions. And you can create as many subscriptions as, as you like. Hmm. And that's how billing works in a nutshell. In other news, uh, we have some new deployment options in Windows Azure. If you deployed anything recently, you notice that we now have East Europe Online. And we also have, uh, excuse me, East Asia Online and West Europe Online. Geographically challenged. Yeah, well, uh, East, West something like that. Anyhow, these two new options are already there with uh, the four previous options giving you a total of six awesome. options. Now you can imagine over time we're probably going to flesh this out and have many, many more options come online and eventually get into quite a few of the geographies. Now, David, you were telling me about a fantastic new application that you discovered running on Windows Azure uh, called Miami 311. Yes, so we're always looking out for brand new applications on Windows Azure to feature on the show. If you have any ideas, please uh, get in touch with, with us on the Twitter account. Um, this one's great. It's miami311.cloudapp.net. Mm -hmm. It's built by um, the, the people of Miami for the, the citizens. And it's all about putting in requests and, and viewing requests for non-emergency services. So if there's a pothole in the road, if there's um, if your trash can hasn't been collected, that kind of thing. Um, this allows both citizens and, and federal government to monitor the requests and, and do some analysis on, on that kind of thing. One of the great things about using the, the Windows Azure for this app is we have a rich interface, um, but also apparently there are hurricanes in, in Miami and a good place to put your data center in Miami is somewhere else. So using Windows Azure gives them 
the ability to run this despite whatever else is going on in the area. <laughs> That's great. You notice here that someone is reporting their garbage truck is too big to go inside the association to pick up the litter. So these sound like high crimes indeed. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, this is a rich Silverlight application. I found one uh, through Twitter and actually kind of went and checked it out, got an account, and it's called Sharp Cloud. It's a really interesting idea. Um, this company essentially puts together a collaborative environment to share their business plans. Uh, very interesting. Uh, so you have it out there, and you very quickly cycle through uh, the different roadmaps and plans, and people can collaborate on it. Um, when you sign in, you can take a look at this. There's some there's some sample uh, plans that they have out here, but you have this really rich uh, interface, and you could pull up different views and visualizations of this. Uh, it, it's just amazing uh, what these guys have done with Silverlight, first of all. And secondly, I'm amazed that these guys have a roadmap that stretches 10 years. I <laughs> literally don't... 10 minutes, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I, I know what I'm doing this weekend if, yeah. at, at best. Anyhow, rich Silverlight application. The back end for this is completely running in Windows Azure yeah, awesome. using our storage subsystem. So uh, a great use of the technology. They're able to scale, get all the benefits of the cloud, and still provide this really rich interface using Silverlight. I thought it was great. Excellent. Now, this brings us to our feature of the week. Now, the feature of the week, we're going to be talking about the role entry point. Every service in Windows Azure actually starts with the role entry point. It doesn't matter if you're a web or a worker role. We are going to launch that role entry point, and we use Reflection to discover the first instance of the role entry point, and then we go ahead and launch that. Now, what I have is uh, Visual Studio open, and I have it just set to the default uh, template that you'll get when, if you were to create a worker role from default. So I haven't done anything to this class. You'll notice I have the run method, the on start method. And I think it's worth spending a little bit of time going through what these things do. So for instance here, we have the on start method. I'll start there. Uh, you'll notice that it's a Boolean. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, while this method runs and until it exits with either a true or false, you're going to be in the busy status on the load balancer. What this means is we will not be sending you traffic. This is your chance to bootstrap your role, to do things like populate caches, uh, discover your topology, whatever it is you need to do before your application starts and before you start accepting traffic. You'll see here that this is the great part uh, or point in your application to start your diagnostics. It's also uh, a great spot to, for instance, set the default connection limit, which allows you to connect more than two times to a single URI resource aka blob storage. Uh, additionally, we have other uh, methods in here or other, other events going on. Um, in particular, the one that most people will be familiar with is the run event. Um, you'll notice that this is void. You don't actually want to return from this. So the typical pattern is you're either going to loop here, doing while true, or you're going to launch another process or something like that that doesn't return itself. If you are going to return from this, you're going to get recycled, and it's going to be a, like a crash in a sense here. Uh, we, won't, we won't know what to do, so we'll just restart your role. By the same token, uh, I should have mentioned that on the on start, if you actually return false here, we're going to instantly stop you as well. Assume that something bad happened and go ahead and try that on start again. You eventually want to return true out of this, or you're going to be in an endless loop. Now. These two uh, methods here that we have, the, the run and the on start, are the primary ones that you're going to be using. So the run is going to be the main work, the on start is going to be the prep. But there's a few things that you can do in here as well that are very valuable. You'll notice by default we have this role environment dot changing and it's pointing to this method. Um, this particular handler here, this role environment changing, you'll notice that what it does by default is it checks for any configuration changes. And if that configuration change were to occur, we set cancel as true, which means recycle the role. Now, you can handle the changing event, which is something that happens before a change in your configuration occurs, or you can handle the changed event, which is something that happens, obviously, after it occurs. Uh, the difference here being uh, before and after the event, and you're going to want to do that in cases where Maybe you need to save some state. Maybe you want to take a snapshot of what happened before the change happened. Maybe you want to reject the change, or maybe you want to not recycle your, your role, depending on what the change is. This is where you handle it. 
We also have another uh, few methods in here. In fact, I will I will pull up the uh, handy red gate net reflector, which will tell you quite a bit about what we do. You'll see that some of the change in the role environment change class that we have. You'll see that we have a few uh, subclasses. In this case, we have the role environment configuration change, which you've seen before. We also have another class derived from that called the topology change. Now this is what will occur when a scaling event occurs. So if you are handling the role change or changing event and you were to find this uh, reported back to you in that event handler, you would know that you were scaling up or down. At this point you could actually take some action. Uh, it could be again figuring out who your peers are or building a hash dictionary of all your endpoints and you'll be able to handle that or, or possibly even recycle the instance depending on what you need. The last one that we should probably point out because it's, it's rather interesting is we have a status check. Now the status check event is something that you're going to want to set uh, if you want to be taken out of the load balancer rotation. Uh, the reason you want to be taken out of the load balancer rotation at some point in time would be if there were an event to be triggered in your application where you knew you needed some more time and you didn't want traffic being redirected to you, you'd go ahead and you would just hook into this event, which happens about every 10 seconds, and you'd set yourself to busy. As soon as we get this busy status, that's going to signal to us, hey, take this out of the load balancer rotation, and we're good. With that, I think you'll see that these are the, the, the building blocks of doing pretty much anything you want to do within the uh, worker role and the role entry point. I should mention that this is the same for uh, not only worker roles, but also web roles. The slight difference in here for a web role is that you're going to have the on start event is going to occur just before application start and the on stop event or, or method is going to occur just before the application stop event in the web role. So if you have some actions to take there, you can uh, hook into those as well. Awesome. So what about, I, I built and deployed an application and it said initializing, initializing busy, initializing busy, and initializing busy. What do I do about that kind of thing? Well, that brings us to the tip of the week. I'm glad you, uh, you mentioned that. It's, not, it's almost like we, uh, we knew what we were going to be talking about in advance. Bizarre. Right? Well, this is a very common thing, actually. Uh, you'll see sometimes the initializing, busy, stopping, initializing, busy, stopping pattern. And um, typically that comes down to the fact that you've forgotten a reference. By default, if you look at the references in your application, you'll see these three things. And you'll notice that uh, in some cases the copy local here has been true. If it's not true, it means that, that we have this gacked actually up in, in the OS. Uh, any, of the, any of the .NET 3.5 assemblies that are gacked locally, they're actually going to be already up in the cloud and you don't have to do anything. However, if you were to have to install something on, on a box after .NET 3.5 SP1, like MVC is a good example, you're going to go ahead and need to hit copy local on those references. If you don't do that, you're actually going to uh, have this stopping uh, behavior and this, yeah. this constant so, so recycling. So if I had a reference to something that's not a base part of the framework, I want to just check that copy yeah. local is set to true. That's, that's a typical one. It's not the only case. Uh, in fact, we, we have a PM on the Windows Azure team who did a, a great job of kind of documenting the common cases. Uh, this is at the blog.toddysm.com, or maybe it's toddysm.com, uh, snipshot, and he has a post out here that says, uh, you know, why does this occur? And basically he runs through a lot of the reasons, the missing dependencies, misconfiguration of the diagnostic string, forgetting to set private keys as exportable, all of those different things which, which can actually trip you up and cause this behavior. So he goes through all these. Um, I definitely recommend going out to, to Toddy's blog and taking a look and seeing if you fall into any of these, uh, these, these checklists that he has and then running through his, his suggestions on, on how to fix them. Some of them are quite obvious. Forgot the reference to copy local, set yeah. it to copy local. Awesome. So this right. is your checklist before deploying. Exactly. Or, awesome. yeah. If you have feedback for us or anything, questions you have or topics you'd like to see covered, go ahead and contact us on Twitter. You can get, it to, get to us at Cloud Cover Show on Twitter. We look forward to your feedback, and until next time, 
Thanks. Thanks.